สวัสดีครั้งนะคะท่านผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่าน Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Crowdfunding Asia Thailand Summit 2015. We hope you have a good opportunity to network and get to make new friends, and more importantly, we hope you've gotten yourself refreshed. Because coming up next, we will have our first panel discussion for the day. On to the topic of payment gateway in Asia. What role it play in the crowdfunding ecosystem? Selecting a payment gateway is like choosing a business partner for all crowdfunding projects. Your choice makes a lot of difference, as it either enrich and uplift your business, or you may suffer losses in time to come. All payment gateway is not developed exactly the same, and most have been tailored to meet highly specific business needs, and that may not be applicable to your crowdfunding campaign. To moderate the first panel discussion, we have Mr. Andrew Dix, who is the CEO and co-founder of the Crowdfund Insider, the leading news and information site for global crowdfunding industry. The Crowdfund Insider was founded in 2012, and as a leading voice and independent advocate for the disruptive innovation of crowdfunding, he has recently co-authored a chapter in a book titled. Crowdfunding, Current Market Dynamics. He is also the Advisor Council of the Crowdfunding Professional Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. Andrew Dix. Hello. Whoa. So, uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, coming to uh, Crowdfunding Asia today. And first of all, I would like to thank, thank uh, Hong Sing. Where are you, Hong Sing? Uh, and her team. Um, she's really put together a very impressive event here. Uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in her first crowdfunding event, Crowdfunding Asia in Singapore last August. And I was very impressed. It was one of the best events I've ever attended in, in the crowdfunding space. Um, so I feel very fortunate to be invited back to come here today to speak to, to you all here. And I also want to thank the uh, Thailand, Thai SEC. Um, I really uh, am um, honored to be involved with an event that you have sponsored. And I think it's fantastic that you have a Securities Exchange Commission that is so forward-thinking and has embraced a new form of finance. Uh, and the disruptive innovation and the power potential of crowdfunding. So thank you very much to uh, Hong Sing and her team, and thank you very much for the Thai SEC. Um, so let's get started here really quickly. Crowdfunding is huge. It's gone from zero to billions in just a few short years, and it's not going to stop there. It's going to grow to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. Um, now, payment processing is not necessarily the most exciting part of crowdfunding, but it's a very important one. And uh, everybody, all the consumers, need to depend on a secure, dependable, and reliable payment experience uh, because billions of dollars are transacted annually and that's going to grow. Today, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, three experts in this space. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Jason Best from Crowdfund Capital Advisors. He is a global crowdfunding uh, expert. And uh, in the United States, he's kind of the godfather of the crowdfunding industry. He's one of the people who helped push the legislation that enacted crowdfunding within the United States, the Jobs Act of 2012. Uh, he's been engaged in the industry since its infancy in the United States and now has expanded his reach across the globe. Uh, you're involved with about 30 different countries right now. And he spends quite a bit of his time uh, in Asia advocating on the behalf and acting as, as counsel for many different uh, uh, governments and agencies and uh, private uh, industry participants. We also have Mr. Samweng Lungfai Bunsri. Hopefully I didn't butcher that name too much. He's the general manager of uh, Pay S Buy, which is a get this right, 
It's a leading e-payments expert in Thailand. They celebrated their 10th year anniversary in uh, 2014. Um, and passed by is one of the first, is the first e-wallet service provider in Thailand and pro provides uh, quite a number of services for the payment processing uh, industry. Um, in 2014, the company forecasted the growth of over 35%. I don't know if they hit it, but I'm going to ask and find out. And then we have uh, Mr. Uh, Punima Vishitawangsa. Hopefully I got that right too. He is the president of the e-business group for True Money. Uh, he has over 17 years experience in finance and technology. Uh, True Corporation's huge. Everybody here knows about who True Corporation is. It's the largest uh, cable TV provider. It's the largest ISP. Uh, it's the third largest mobile operator. And they're also in the payment platform space. So right now I'd like to ask the three of you to come up and uh, join me up here on the panel. So come on up, guys. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, thank you for coming up today. Um, I'm going to start off by just asking everybody uh, kind of an update on, on what you see is occurring in the, the, the Thai crowdfunding industry space. Um, it's quite new. It's quite new around the world. You know, uh, someone, can you give me an update as to what's going on in the, the Thai crowdfunding space today? Where do, how do you see it today? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, really exciting about this session because of that you mentioned about a very new in Thailand market yeah, for crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I start from uh, we are uh, online payment in Thailand named uh, Paysabai.com. I'm not sure uh, the audience is uh, used to heard about Paysabai before. Uh, we set up the company more than uh, 10 years. We provide uh, 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 the process on the credit card payment, uh, online banking, and cash at the counter. We also provide a uh, service for e-commerce platform for more than uh, 10 years. And a lot of uh, kind of business is the same like the, that you saw on the online to buy something, and you can use uh, our payment for the one op option. For the uh, crowdfunding in Thailand, that I believe it just very new for Thai people. But normally we saw that uh, it start from like the donation in Thailand. Uh, the one website that uh, we use, PaySwipe also, and uh, we will come on the evening to talk about uh, the crowdfunding or donation online. The name uh, thai.com. I'm not sure who when heard about the THI. We also have a lot of uh, like the campaign and a lot of, uh, I, I can say that like the uh, donator to donate the money to, to many campaign. So this one is only that I think in uh, Thailand market to do is very well. It's for uh, charity and expect to uh, uh, donate. Mm -hmm. And I just heard from last year, we have a new model is coming to Thailand markets, like the social giver. The concept is chain that I know we uh, normally we uh, donate, but this time it's uh, like the, we give some like the reward for hotel, for discount coupon or something. And uh, really in interesting that if it's happened in uh, Thailand, we, we make a lot of like the new uh, uh, entrepreneur or new, mm -hmm. new, new uh, starter that you want to start a business. That this one is like the startup uh, platform for them to promote their service and announce this one to anyone. And I hope that in the future we will have a lot of uh, new model uh, platform like that. You will in in. Uh, 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 outside Thailand that Kickstarter, I'm also using it and pay a lot of money and waiting for right. yeah. <laughs> some product when we finish. Uh, for Thailand market, it's still young 
in this uh, model. Yes. And we hope everybody in the audience that want to make it happen in Thailand. So, yeah. I, th I think everybody here is a believer, so you got a good audience. Punima, what's your perspective on the, the crowdfunding industry in Thailand? I, I know it's early, but you know, where is it now? Where is it going? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit, I'll explain a bit about what True Money is, uh, just to give some context, and then I'll, I'll answer the question. So True Money is a um, payment provider, the payment processor in, in Thailand. We're similar to PayPal, um, except that we do a lot more than PayPal. Um, you know, because in countries like Thailand or in Southeast Asia in general, the credit card population is very small. In Thailand, we have about 27 million credit cards um, out of the about approximately 67 million populations. But those 27 million cards, um, it's hold by about 9 million people. Uh, so one person on average have three cards. Um, and of that, the only of the 9 million unique card holder, only about 2 million uh, have experienced uh, shopping online or paying things online. So basically you got 2 million of the 67 million people who are able to do payment online or who are willing to do payment online. So uh, a lot of un, um, you know, underbanked population or uncard populations, and that's, that's really where the um, true money and, and, and also pay by as well that I try to address. The, um, so true money we, we process, we have a payment uh, gateway that, that accepts credit cards and e-wallet and other the form of payments, including internet banking the, um, and also cash transactions over our agent network, which we have over about 16,000 agent network uh, throughout the country of Thailand. Um, on the consumer side, we have uh, what's called e-wallet, right? So this, this is a part that's more similar to PayPal. The, except that our e-wallet, besides credit card link, the, we also accept cash in through any 7-Eleven. So you can literally go walk, walk up to 7-Eleven, put the money into your e-wallet by handing over cash at over the counter. And that's opened up the whole populations um, to, you know, to e-wallet concept. Last year, in 2014, we processed approximately 1.8 billion US dollar the worth of, um, of, of transactions volume. In Thailand? In Thailand alone, yeah, 1.8 billion. Uh, that's, it's growing, it grew about 45% uh, from a volume perspective. That's big. It's, yeah, it's okay. That's a, that's it can good, be bigger. That's a good rate of growth. <laughs> it should be bigger. Um, so so that's, that's, that's in a nutshell of what we do. We are, we are part of the CP group conglomerate that where Besides the uh, ICT business under the name True, uh, we own you know, 7-Eleven, you know, Macro, and other retail businesses along with agriculture-based business. So that's in a nutshell of what True Money is. The besides True Money, I also oversee our incubation fund, investment fund. That is a small incubation fund investing in seed money um, in startup in Thailand. That it's about US $10 million dollar fund. Uh, and we invest over about 15 uh, companies already. So that's the, um, the context, the background. In terms of your questions where, where I see the crowdfunding, crowd, uh, crowdfunding situations in Thailand. So um, besides being early, obviously you know, we, there's a four major categories of crowdfunding yeah. um, that previous speaker talked about. Yes. Right? The, um, the donation base, the, the material base, or a project base. Right, and then the, um, the lending base, and then equity base. So on the donation base, the, um, it's a bit further along. You know, we got a website called Tejai the, that the, um, Kun Som Wang mentioned earlier. Then there's a, a fair amount of you know, projects um, that going on. So that's, that's a bit further uh, coming along. Um, in terms of project space, I haven't seen much. Um, you know, I, I think most Thai people just go to Kickstarter for interesting project. Um, so that, that could be interesting, and yeah, there's two booths outside here that try to initiate a uh, project-based um, you know, fundraising. Um, and, and that have the opportunity. Obviously, the key is, the, um, is you know, the, the, the quality of ideas, the, of products, of, of projects. The, um, and like anything else, you know, how, do we, how do we create trust on this platform? Right. Right? The, which we'll, we'll come back to that. The, the third part the, um, of the crowdsourcing um, is uh, the crowdfunding, sorry, is the lending base, right? Uh, this is the most exciting in my opinion because it has both social values and uh, commercial values, right? In Thailand, 
the, most of you may know, it's a huge informal lending sector. Yeah. In fact, the informal lending sector, or in a, nutshell, in, in a simple word, it's loan chart, right? Loan charting. That is as big as the formal lending sector. Yeah, it's 50-50. 50% formal, 50% informal from the volume perspective. So in the loan chart business, informal lending sector, it's obviously create all kinds of social problems, right? It's, yeah, um, you, you know, have to start with the name change there, you know, loan shark. You know, <laughs> yeah. So, the, um, so obviously the government is trying to tackle from the m many different ways from the, the um, le releasing uh, or le reducing regulatory hurdle, you know, come yes. up microfinance and now no, nano finance. But that can solve some of the problems, right? The, some of the problems. The um, peer to peer, Crowds uh, funding, I think this, um, there's a good um, opportunities there yes. uh, from both sides, uh, from the borrower side and also from the lender side or slash investor side, right? Uh, given the low interest rate um, situations that Thailand is in, right. the saving rate in Thailand is about what the saving interest rate in Thailand ranging from about 0.5% uh, to about 2% depending on the terms. Um, so with that, uh, while the lending business, the informal lending business, it can go up to over 100% the interest rate. The, um, the government came up with the nano finance scheme, which offer up to 36% 36, 36 the annual APR for, um, you know, for interest rate. So if individual investor, the, you know, you're getting about 2%, right? You may be able to lend it out um, over a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, the, getting a lot more, you know, in, even in the mid-teens, uh, that's hugely more attractive, but obviously it comes with risk and all that. Um, but yet, that's another opportunity to, to change the, the, the industry with giving the, the, the data available out there on a social network and so-called big data. So the, um, just in short, lending as a crowdfunding, I think that's the most uh, super, super exciting from both con uh, social and commercial perspective. The fourth category, uh, crowdfunding for based on equity, that's a huge hurdle to overcome, huge. You know, I mean, you got regulatory framework um, that need to, you need to go come. How do you protect consumer? Uh, how do you protect investor? Um, investor rights, you know, how do you make the legal framework around, around that? Well, I'm excited, but, you know, I need to be, you know, we need to be cautiously, cautiously optimistic about that. Okay. You know, there need to be a lot of framework um, that uh, get in place um, to enable the crowds of funding for equity exchange. That's really interesting that you bring up the lending side, and I want to come back to you here in a second about that because I find that very interesting that, that he sees the peer-to-peer -peer lending space as, as the, the aspect of the industry that, he, that is most interesting. And in fact, around the globe, that's the largest aspect of, of crowdfunding. Um, so first, I want to go to Jason. And Mr. Global Expert here, I want to hear some of his perspective. He spends a lot of time traveling around uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, to hear what his view is on what's going on in Thailand, but also the rest of Asia. Thank you, and it's great to be here uh, with my panelists, and always great to be back in Thailand. Um, in addition to the work that I do on crowdfunding, I'm also a partner in a very small media tech, uh, kind of a digital media company here in Bangkok. And so uh, I've had actually also through that media company, we had a, did a documentary film uh, that's uh, based here in Bangkok uh, on the Bangkok University. And we raised uh, $39,000 uh, for, uh, for the fi finishing films for that film by Kickstarter. About half that money came from uh, Thailand and about half from the United States. Uh, and so we did that in 2000, 2012. So I, I um, I'm certainly no expert in the, in the Thai crowdfunding market specifically, but it's, it's been interesting to see how um, this, this market has evolved very, very rapidly. And I think that's my key theme for Asia more broadly is the market has evolved extremely rapidly. It sort of speaks to what we talked about in some research that we did for the World Bank in 2013, where we talked about uh, models for developing economies using crowdfunding. And the topic that we, kind of the, the phrase we used was we really felt like that developing economies have the opportunity to uh, leapfrog over developed economies in the utilization of, of crowd finance, both debt and equity crowdfunding. And so I think uh, Thailand is really moving forward very quickly. Uh, I think it will end up being 
one of the leaders in the space in Asia, certainly from a standpoint of its adoption of rules, the, the, the fact that the SEC is, is taking such uh, positive and, and careful steps in, in creating a framework and soliciting public feedback in uh, soliciting expert, infer, you know, expert input and best global best practices, I think speaks very highly of the process that they're using to address the concerns, of which there are many. Uh, and I think that any, any government has to be very, very careful in how it regulates a new form of, 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 uh, of equity investing, or, or debt investing for that matter. Because uh, there certainly could be just as, uh, as much opportunity for fraud on the debt side as there is on the equity side. Uh, we have seen absolutely debt grow much faster, uh, the adoption of debt crowdfunding grow much faster. And I think that's because the exit for your investment is very clear, uh, that you know I'm going to get my money back if the loan performs and I will have interest on my money, and I know a, a predictable rate of return. And if we believe the global uh, numbers, uh, it says that really uh, usually about 3 to 4% default rate. So a default rate that most banks would be fairly happy with. And uh, I know here, and in many parts of Asia, we have a large informal set of, of loan sharks. In uh, the US and Europe, we have a very formalized set of loan sharks. Um, that are just companies called uh, payday lenders, or they are uh, receivables companies uh, that charge the same rates as the loan sharks uh, in, in other countries, uh, but it's institutionalized uh, that way. And so what I'm most excited about on the debt side of, of uh, crowd finance is the opportunity for transparency to occur. And with that transparency, you'll get lower rates. Uh, we've certainly seen that the competition as competition increases in that space, um, the, the rates have come down dramatically. Uh, or more importantly, for businesses who never had access to capital before, for successful businesses who have a decade of profits, who have 10 years of experience, who have thousands of customers, now they can have access to funding for the very first time. And that's really, really very critically important. So I think that for, and, and for uh, not only for, for high tech companies, which I know in, in rooms like this, we spend a lot of time talking about high-tech companies and startups, and that's a critically important part of every economy. I think it's what's, what's also very powerful about crowd finance, both debt and equity crowdfunding, is the opportunity to help support traditional SMEs as well. SMEs that have customers, that have profits, and that want to grow. And so that's what, for me, is, is, is very, very exciting. I think that while it, the statistics you shared were extremely interesting with regard to the adoption of online payments, um, and the growth rates are quite excellent. Um, and I think that globally, uh, we, we see those sorts of, um, that online payments are accelerating, because people will say to me, well, but people don't, in my country don't really use uh, online payments that much. But that's true today, but it's also true is that every year, the number of online payments increases, and every year, the number of people using online payments increases. And so I think that um, this opportunity, uh, crowd finance offers another use case, another opportunity for people to become familiar with what this experience is like. And so I think that it's a, another opportunity for, for more payments. I think the number one issue uh, in, in countries that adopt uh, crowd finance are, are payments. How are we going to make the payments? Uh, and then number two issue is delivery. How do I get what I was promised? Whether it's a, a, a gift from Kickstarter, whether it's um, the repayment of my loan, or the performance on, on the equity. Uh, obviously, these are all high-risk investments, and the, one of the big issues in every market that we go to is education. Investor education is really important because we want to make sure that the retail investor understands that this is a high-risk investment that this is something you should put only a very small percentage of your portfolio in. Uh, and that people should understand that this, should, this is high risk and should only be applied in very, very certain individual cases where you know the entrepreneur, where you know the business owner. And so we want to, because you only have to start with that. I think some of the statistics that are interesting you know, in the US and in Europe and in other countries, about 80% of the funding of a successful crowdfunding campaign comes from your first or second degree LinkedIn connections. So you really need to consider that you're bringing your own crowd when you crowdfund in most cases. And so, and that's how it will be, I believe, in every country. 
because you'll have to start that way. But then over time, as trust and experience increases, just like in, in your business with online payments, as that trust and experience increases, then more people will try it, more people will try it. So anyway, I've gone on for quite a bit. All right, that's great. Thank you. Penny, well, I'm going to jump back to you because you started talking about debt and debt crowdfunding, which is absolutely enormous in the United States. Um, and as uh, uh, Jason alluded to, and, and Penny Ma, you, you talked about it, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to undercut existing uh, firms in the space. Uh, in, in the United States, Prosper and Lending Club and uh, Sophie, they've moved quickly to undercut credit card companies and traditional banks by giving lenders a higher rate of return and giving borrowers a much better interest rate. So you obviously are sizing this up for Thailand. You want to move big in this direction. Tell me, what's going to happen? What's your strategy here? How is it going to roll out? You know, give me the inside scoop. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, but really, I, I think it's, it's, it's start to, um, I think it's, it's start from the opportunity point of view, right? Really, um, and just the timing, the stars are uh, become more aligned now. So the, the opportunity, as, as mentioned to you, um, it's the informal lending is as big as the formal lending itself. Now, um, giving a number of factors, the one is regulatory concern, the regulatory uh, framework that no one in Thailand under the regular income of 15,000 baht on a monthly basis, um, if you're below that, you cannot qualify for credit cards, right? Um, and most credit products uh, will, will have um, will have the um, barrier around that income range as well. There's some exceptions, but generally that's, that's the case. Um, then, then you have the, the, um, the access, right? You know, the financial institutions, the access to the rural area, the underbanked uh, populations that are very far from your bank branch. Um, so so one, is, one is that um, there's a hurdle to enter, and two, and there's a hurdle to reach them as well from the, the, from, um, from, from the lender side. So the, the timing is very interesting uh, from multiple angles. The, number one is that regulatory framework realize that this is the hurdle, the, um, and they do the right thing. Rather than lower the, 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 the boundary, they try to come up with uh, other scheme, like the, nano, the so-called nano finance, and approach the non-traditional mm -hmm. financial institutions. because. You see, even banks try to do it. Their cost structure would not enable them to reach the, to the rural area effectively. So the like of the telcos or big retailers that have much lower cost to serve in reaching them. And they are prime candidates um, to offer the, you know, the, the, the alternative lending um, from the formal you know, the institution's perspective. Now, the peer-to-peer -peer lending, the, it address another market, right? Address the pools of the individuals who want to invest a bit more, yeah? So the key is the two things. The one from the borrower side, how do you get them onto the platform? Because from the social economics, the, um, these group, most of them, may not, well, many of them may not be digital literate, okay. right? How do you get themselves onto the digital platform to be, to be known, to be qualified? So that, that needs to be done. Um, and therefore, many country, uh, some countries, there's agents that help in getting you know, people who want to borrow on the peer-to-peer -peer lending onto the, the, um, on, um, onto the platform. And then there's the um, investor side. You know, how do you get them on board? That's the easy part. Now, you, you, you just need certain the framework the, um, to, you know, to accept the, um, their investment the, um, and then disbursement. Then in the middle, you need to create, just like any lending uh, business, you need to create the, um, distribution, collection, and credit rating. Yeah. Now, this is the interesting part, given today that there's uh, quite a bit of social information, there's a bit of information out on the internet, yeah. born both on a social network, and, um, and you know, we just heard interesting statistic here that the, most of the peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, or crowdsourcing has happened from the first or second link so that's kind of confirmed that the um, data on social network, if used well, it can establish a baseline for certain credit rating. Are you using that now? 
Uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't entered a business yet, but obviously... You're going to. Uh, well, we, 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 we're looking into it, right? We, we're looking into it. The, um, we there, have confirmation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some interesting model, for example, in Brazil, yeah. right? Uh, a, a, a telco in Brazil, the, um, along with retailers, have done some credit rating the, um, based on the information that they have. Now, you layer, lay, um, you layer on top of that the social network information. Um, I think it, it can, can come to some interesting along with you know, the, um, the model of lending that we may have seen um, in, in other um, countries that has been somewhat successful, like Bangladesh, the Grameen Foundation have some, done some really interesting stuff there. So in a nutshell, um, the stars are become more aligned in terms of interest on both sides, from the borrower side, they need some help to get onto digital platform, uh, onto the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, on the investor side to get them on board and assist them with to qualify the risk factor of the borrower and also assist in collection, right? Distribution, the, um, distribution can be a bit of a problem, the, um, but I think more importantly is the collection part. You know, how do you, how do you collect, especially in the case of the delinquency or slow the repayment, you know? So th those are the things that from the peer-to-peer -peer lending perspective um, need to come into place. Interesting. Are, are, do you see the the peer-to-peer -peer lenders partnering with banks, or being independent of banks and, and true competitors? Um, I, I think it will take a lot for banks to understand and, and act, um, because you know banks, given their cost structure, the, their mentality, their priority priority peer-to-peer -peer lending is probably down in the bottom of the value chain of the priority list. So you need um, you need to work with the um, partners, the, the, the ideal lend, uh, lender or lending platform provider would be someone who have distribution, right? Would be someone who have collection network, would be someone to have a fair amount of data um, to do credit rating. Sounds yeah. like true. Well, I mean, we are one of the candidates, right? But there's many others as well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, so Song Wang. Tell me, you know, you, you guys are friendly competitors. You're in the same space, right? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah no, no. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts on the peer-to-peer the, the -peer lending space? And how do you see it evolving? And where do you guys fit in? Well, uh, actually, I'm in the, doing the big thing like him. Uh, but uh, my mother company is uh, DTAC. It's owned by Tenor. You know that you mentioned about the Gamin phone. They have the the model of uh, Easy Pesa. Easy Pesa is doing uh, uh, like the P2P uh, transfer and bill payment concept in Bangladesh, and it worked very well when uh, compared with bank in the Bangladesh. That I used to be there in, uh, one time, then I saw that they use this model for uh, because of uh, the 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 like the the people in their country cannot do access to uh, online or digital or any, any uh, internet. They just use like the uh, agent. Agent can help to, to provide the uh, lending and they also uh, like the, have the platform to, 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 to manage the money. And the problem in uh, the, the underdeveloping country like the Bangladesh or some area in Thailand that they didn't have uh, the credit lie or credit uh, information of the people uh, and they cannot to provide to access to all the area. They just uh, have some uh, people can, can, uh, can access to, 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 to uh, this model. But it, they have the idea of uh, DTAC or uh, Antreno want to do this model in, in Thailand also and we are looking for the, how we can use like the big data in their hand, like the, how, uh, what, uh, uh, how much per month they spend for data, for uh, call, for anything, and to analyze that what, uh, how much they can get uh, the, the money or the loan and what they can charge for the interest, something like this. This one is uh, the, the big thing that I, I didn't uh, touch a lot with the, my mother company. We just on the online uh, for pay by many people 
the many models is come to Thailand in the past, like the concept is not not like the lending, they just like the the concept of a group buying that we know that yeah. in the past. Uh, I'm not sure. I can share the, the, the idea that the compare between the, this model and, and the model they're becoming. That the same. The group buying concept is we like the, uh, we collect a lot of crowd people and collect the money and uh, use huge money to bargain with the, the the merchant and get the some discount or coupon or something. And uh, point of this is uh, the provider or uh, the merchant that we uh, we bought something from them, how we can uh, uh, make sure that they can give me the product or give me the, the service. Or the uh, provider or the, 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 the portal that they do this with is also how uh, we can uh, manage or we can touch them that I give the money to them and they can get the product back or not. Because of when we saw some news in the past that some uh, provider in the concept of group buying is, uh, didn't provide a service or product. Same like that we announce or advertise on the online. So this one is a major problem in, in the market of uh, Thailand also. And don't want the crowdfunding concept in terms of uh, the lending or uh, uh, money sourcing like this is when we have the problem in the future also. Yeah, yep. so, so that's interesting. Um, you're partnering with Alibaba. Uh, just with uh, the subsidiary of them is Alipay. Alipay. We accept Alipay. the Alipay in it, one of the payment methods in our service. Is everybody partnering with Alibaba these days? I mean, they're, <laughs> they're everywhere, right? Yep. So, so how is this going to to play out? Your partnership with Alibaba. Uh, I first of all, I start from the we are accept the payment from uh, Alibaba or Alipay, okay. and we plan to be uh, the one of payment option for Alibaba. It's me like. Thai people can buy uh, anything from China by using my uh, payment method on our uh, on on Alibaba platform. Yep. Okay. So we cross like, the, the the payment exchange something. Okay, excellent. Punima, so you're better than PayPal. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we know that. Why are you better? Why are you? What differentiates you from PayPal? What? Okay, that's very simple. Um, <laughs> number one. Uh, Pay, PayPal, even today, doesn't, doesn't have payment license in Thailand, right? <laughs> so they're not operating well, legally. Well, okay, there you have it. Um, number two is that, them out. that PayPal only largely accepts uh, credit card payment. Right? Right. And as, as mentioned earlier, only 2 million people in Thailand have experience or willing to do online payment. So, um, so there we go. Now, number three, um, you have problem with PayPal, who do you call, right? There's no single person represent PayPal in Thailand, not, at least not yet. So, yeah, so it, it, I yeah. don't know who you call in the United States either. So. Yeah. yeah, so PayPal is not even uh, a, a viable option. But I mean, to be fair, um, they are well known, right? And, um, and, you know, and, and at least on, on our part, through money part, we haven't done a, um, a good job enough in advertising ourselves uh, to become, uh, you know, the, to be known the, um, as an alternative to PayPal. So, but, but we're doing that. That's coming. Yeah, that, sure. definitely. Yeah. We're coming. Yeah. So, okay, so excellent. So, We've established the fact that you're better than PayPal. Let's move on to, uh, you know, fraud and reliability and security. Jason, you know, give me your 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 worldview on this because there's been some issues out there, uh, but there's also a lot of successes out there. Yeah, I mean, uh, fraud's a top concern. It is everywhere we go. It's got to be addressed. Uh, I think creating a completely fraud-free environment is, you know, kind of like. A, a beautiful state we'd all like to reach, uh, but we have to do all we can to, to control and protect. So far in the crowd finance space, fraud has been remarkably low. Uh, the largest uh, kind of platform in any of the crowd finance space is Kickstarter because of the number of projects and the amount of money that they've raised. And there was uh, research done by a Wharton uh, Business School professor uh, and he found that less than one-tenth of one percent of those uh, campaigns were fraudulent. So a very small number uh, of, uh, of campaigns were fraudulent. Now, the, the, the reverse of the other side of fraud is failure to deliver. 
Uh, and there have been many cases where campaigns have failed to deliver the products they promised. And that's, but and it, what's important for a back to investor education is helping people to understand the difference between fraud and failure. And so that they can understand that. And two, creating the transparency tools and creating communication mechanisms to allow the entrepreneur to communicate effectively with either their donors or their investors or their borrowers. And so that they can have that ability to interact, just like we have investor relations tools for large public companies today, and the ability for them to interact with their investors, we still have to create those tools in this space. And, and those are coming. And so that's, I guess, what I would say about fraud. I mean, there's certainly the, the Kickstarter was, uh, was hacked a few months ago by fraudsters. They were not able to take any credit card data, but they did take personal information. Uh, but there have been many large retailers around the world who have had their systems hacked. And so, you know, securities experts uh, like Hong Sin will have lots of business for many years to, uh, in defending us against uh, internet uh, hackers. Uh, but, you know, I think that there are, uh, it's, it's a constant battle. Yeah, that's big. You have to be able to depend on the, the platform um, that you're giving your money to or transacting your money. So, uh, Punima, talk to me about how you guard against fraud mm -hmm. and how you see that evolving over time. Because it's a big issue, as Jason mentioned. Kickstarter was hacked. About every other week in the United States, somebody announces that they've had a security breach. So it's something that everybody's kind of gotten used to, which is kind of a sad state of affairs. So what, what are you doing? What is your company doing to guard against fraud? Sure. So I think we need to separate fraud into um, two portions yeah. um, from the crowd, uh, crowdfunding perspective. The fraud, fraud on the payment processing, right? The, and then fraud on the projects, yeah? So I'll, I'll, I'll speak about the, um, maybe I'll, I'll fraud on project first. The, um, Jason mentioned a good point. We need to educate the market, investor, the lender. There's a difference pre between fraud and failures, right? There are, and, and for new investor, new lender, they may not have a clear distinction. Yeah, so that needs to be educated. The, um, there's risk involved in investing in projects or in lending. The, um, and there are honest failure, and that is okay. That needs to be accepted. But there are fraudulent projects. Yeah, the, um, and even without crowdsourcing uh, today, in, in social society today, there's a bunch of uh, fraudulent you know, projects. Yeah, people ask for money for you know for doing something, but they 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 just pocket it. So there need to be a mechanics. That, um, in when you move that onto online world, to separate the physical interactions, there need to be a, an even better ways that, um, to detect and protect. Yeah, and and we we have done that in certain the, um, in certain online business. For example, e marketplace, right? When people buy things online from person to person, how do you um, believe that it's a, you know, it's a, a correct product, yeah? So obviously there's a feedback system, reputation system, like what eBay, Amazon have done. Likewise, uh, similarly, those can be implemented onto the peer-to-peer the -peer, um, or the uh, crowd, uh, crowdfunding So this is project. another new feature you're gonna launch soon, right? Well, it, it's something that has to be done, yeah. It's a prerequisite, I think. Um, and, the, and, and provided you need to put efforts, there, um, there should be a pre-qualification of projects. Because you see, especially the pioneer in the, in the industry take huge responsibility for the success of the industry. If the pioneer of the industry screw it up, it will take a long time for the public to trust again. That's so true. the initial provider, whoever it may be, um, should do a good job of qualifying projects um, and build you know, either a system um, people-wise or technology-wise in place such that it minimizes fraudulent projects or fraudulent uh, borrowers. Even having, having done that, there need to be a legal framework at the end right, to get rid of bad people, yeah? um, just like how we have bankruptcy law yeah, in the formal lending sector. So, um, so that's, that's the regulatory part that need to play a role. Um, that's on the project side. 
on the fraudulent on the payment processor, I don't have much concern um, or, uh, on that side. Obviously, that's technology, you know, and, and I'm talking about this is talking about hacking the payment gateway, hacking yeah. the website, and things like that. Um, honestly, we are too small for you know for for hackers, international hackers, to pay attention. Oh, no. you'd be surprised. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, they'll, 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 they'll go through that list and then they'll, they'll go through bigger, <laughs> no, they'll, they'll go through banks first. The, um, internet banking especially, yeah, and there's a lot more money Those there. Those poor so, banks. Yeah, so don't worry about us. Yeah, so, but anyway, so, but we, in, in, uh, regardless, we protect ourselves. You know, just like how PaySoFi protect themselves, the, um, there are the, um, you know, the both technology perspective, um, there's process perspective the, um, to, um, to detect fraud. The, um, in our business, the, um, we, Last year, we, we, we happy and we continue to keep our finger crossed. We, our fraudulent rate um, is zero point and then yeah, add another seven zeros. That's really it. good. Yeah, we, that's because impressive. we, uh, not, not, not saying that we are, we are super great, no. The, um, that we, sounds super great to me. No, 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 I, I think we're just too small from, you know, from the international hacker point of view. As we get bigger, I'm sure we'll, we'll attract more, more hackers. Yeah. yeah. Jason, you wanted to add something quickly? Just one quick thing. Um, to, to kind of follow on your comment, from a fraud perspective, the thing I'm most concerned about with fraud are fake platforms. So a, pla a company that sets up a fake platform and then uh, puts fake projects on it and, and, takes, and takes money that way. And I think that's, um, that's one, another reason why having the, the following the general secretary's, uh, secretary general's um, suggestion of a uh, crowdfunding association makes a lot of sense. Because if you have a crowdfunding association with members that have been uh, licensed and approved by the SEC, then you have uh, the good actors together, and they can help with self-policing. And it makes it much more obvious uh, when you have bad actors. Someone, fraud, having a, a reliable, de dependable, transactional platform that consumers can trust. How are you guys doing this? How are you going to do this going forward? Yeah, actually, for the, the normal business that we do, we also uh, process the transaction per day. It's uh, 15,000 daily. So the fraud is uh, the normal thing that <laughs> we have on our line. That Kun said that uh, the, the fraud have the two parts. One is uh, from the uh, part, issuing part, and another one is uh, from the, uh, the merchant. So for this, case or this uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, project that we we think is uh, the fr from the, the the project owner or the the, the 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 merchant more because of in terms of the, the fraud from the issuing side or the credit card or the bank transfer is a simple way that we manage we already have uh, the team and we already have a system to monitor the tension uh, but the point is how we can uh, the protect, the prevent the fraud from the, the uh, merchant or the, the, uh, the projects. And the platform or the portal that we need to uh, verify them. So the, like the, the, the government or uh, sec try to do is how to liberate uh, the, the, the portal like this and how to uh, certify what the good of uh, the portfolio or the, the sorry the portal and uh, the the project that we we run in the portal so i concerned about the, the how we can when if the the, the, the project is not reach target the point is if we accept the money from the credit card how to refund the money. So actually, because of, because of in Thailand, it may, I'm not sure it's different in uh, another country, because of we do a transaction on the credit card, actually the, the bank or the, the, the card issuer is not refund for the fee that we charge. It's be like when the transaction is complete already, and uh, you can have the time to uh, dispute or refund the money within the uh, uh, 180 day, but normally when the merchant accept the money already, when we request to refund the money, if the target is not reached, it's really uh, take really difficult. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, the money is gone already, <laughs> and uh, didn't except for the 
we charge the fee and we cannot to refund the fee. It's me like the money, uh, total money is go to the merchant, but when the, you refund, you need to refund total and plus the fee also. In Thailand, not allowed to refund uh, the fee. Okay. We charge already, but we cannot return it. Yep. This is a point that the service provider like us is will be concerned if the, the model of the car funding happen in the future. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Punima, I want to go back to this, the equity-based crowdfunding. You expressed some concern about that aspect of the crowdfunding industry. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So obviously for equity, the, um, the investor will, uh, will, will take the stake in the company. So how do you protect investor? The, um, and I'll separate into portions. The, we'll, we'll leave crowd fund, uh, crowdsourcing out for now. Just, just regular investor today. As an angel investor, the um, regulatory framework the, um, is still very loose in terms of how angel investors are protected. Um, and from that, I, I mean, basically, angel investor today in, in Thailand is investing in the, at, at complete their own risk, right? If money gets fraudulent by entrepreneurs, then good luck, go chase after them themselves. Um, so there, there should be some regulatory framework to protect angel investor. On that sense, yeah. Now, when you move to crowdfunding, you basically divide angel investor one person to you know ten thousand. So there's a lot more work um, in, in in going to um, that level, and the amount of paperwork involved um, in in well, okay. Uh, first is qualifying, right? You know, would would we need to qualify investor for equity based crowdfunding, or do it at your own risk? If let's say just do at your own, your own risk, then what are the frame the legal framework to give the proof that the individual investor own equity in the company? You know, can the, the um, peer to peer or not peer crowdfunding investment platform yes. um, act on that role? Is there a framework to entitle them to do that? You know, the, um, is it legal enforceable? Now, those are the things that need to be think through, yeah. Okay. Um, and that's just purely on the equity side, you know. So, so I, I think the, um, my concern is just from from my own experience as a that we are incubation fund, as mentioned earlier, that we work with a number of angel investor, and a classic uh, request has always been yes, our angel investor will say yeah, I'll, I'll put in money, but the company need to be registered in Singapore, right, or in other countries because there's a legal framework to protect, and there's is the, the and that's on the downside. On the upside, there's a um, continuity um, of you know uh, further investment from foreign money sources, um, and you know tax implications and all that. So, my point is that we need to think through as a as a consortium or as an industry the participants. We need to think through holistically. What does it take? It's not just simple to say, let's, let's do uh, crowd investing into a company. There's a lot more into it. You know, how, how do we take an entrepreneur, help him or her guide through to a successful the business? Because really that's the end goal. The end goal is not to create a crowdfunding platform, right? That is just the mean to the, to the end. Um, but sometimes we, uh, so we need to focus on the right thing. The right thing is how do you get entrepreneurs to become more successful have sustainable business and hopefully have some kind of exit, either through dividends or through IPO. Right. And then work backward from there, you know, the, what is required to get these entrepreneurs the, um, to be sustainable. And obviously, uh, one part is funding. And then therefore, what required to get the proper funding the, in place. Yeah. Okay, well, very good. That's, that was a good answer. Very quickly, because we're almost running out of time here before we open up for questions. Are you transacting Bitcoin? I think it was yesterday that there was a, a, a Hong Kong Bitcoin shop that vaporized. It, it kind of disappeared with, you know, a couple hundred million, whatever, you know, it's gone. Um, are, are either of you in this space or both of you in this space? What do you think about Bitcoin really quickly? So, yeah, no, we're not processing Bitcoin. Right? Not yet. <laughs> no, no, no. Until, until the Bank of Thailand say, us, say to us that <laughs> they allow us to do, then no. Right. <laughs> but I still not. As you uh, done the uh, process of Bitcoin, but I, I heard from a lot of friends to invest in uh, Bitcoin also, <laughs> but it's, uh, some friend is lose, some friend is uh, gone again a little bit. Yep. 
but that same uh, if uh, Bank of Thailand did not allow it, we should not to do it. <laughs> okay. Well, now we know. Jason, did you want to add anything about Bitcoin specifically? Sure. No, I mean I think it's. I, I, it's been interesting to see it develop. I saw the story in Crawford Insider about that uh, Hong Kong uh, issue in, bank, in Bitcoin. I think that for me, it's, it's a super interesting space. The whole virtual currency space is really, really interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting innovation that comes out of it. Um, whether or not Bitcoin is the ultimate uh, winner in that space, we don't know. But I think that it'll, what's interesting is to see how countries react and how countries think about virtual currencies, whether they create their own or, or different kinds of virtual currencies that will get used in the future. Excellent. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? I think we have a few more minutes. Who's, who's watching my time? Do we have any questions? Just raise your hand. Anybody? All right. You answered all the questions. You have any uh, parting comments, Samoy? You, any party and words of wisdom? Wisdom. Yes. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, for my the thing that I want to leave for the, the audience or the regulator, that uh, I'm worried about it one because of uh, uh, how we can protect the investor that will be happen in the future because of social media is uh, very rich to everybody that know the information and same like the stock market also when they, we heard from the social media to invest uh, some uh, stock so we cannot to control them investor with some investor lose a lot because of their they hurt and they believe on the mm -hmm. social media so this thing is uh, the point that we need to leave and uh, uh, the platform provider also how so that uh, me is a payment service provider that we provide a payment for them, but it cannot to guarantee that this platform is, uh, 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 can serve or can provide, so it can, can do the, the, the campaign that they, they, they announce or not. So we need to have like, the support from uh, regulator, and we want to cooperate between the, uh, the crowdfunding platform or operator. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Benima? Sure. Um, it's, it's definitely exciting and scary time. You know, the exciting time because we are seeing the, um, a, for the first time, I think in the financial history, the, um, a, well, some people say de uh, democratizing, right? Uh, but bas basically a uh, breakdown of, the, um, of a lot of barriers to solve social problems, you know? Um, so, some people may, uh, may approach from the commercial aspect, especially in the well-banked um, population. And yes, that's good. You know, you, you undercut rates and all that. That's, that's great for consumers. In countries like Thailand and most of ASEAN's country, it's about solving social problems at the same time. A lot of social problems happens because the underbank have no access to financial access at all. And oftentimes, they are being ripped off um, by other alternative. So this the um, breakdown through technology and innovation of business model um, and open up for individual consumer to participate through crowd for, uh, crowds funding is truly exciting, truly exciting. And in fact, if do properly, it provides much lower cost to serve than the traditional financial institutions um, who besides their rigid mindset, it's very difficult for them to move. So, so it's very exci exciting time uh, because we're solving real social problems here. But at the same time, it's a very scary time. If not done properly, the, um, we will set the industry back for multiple years. You know, if, we let, um, if we let fraudulent activities happen, you know, drive by, uh, <laughs> I call it drive by shooting, you know, I mean, just you know, come and That's go. That's kind of scary. Yeah, so, the, um, so what needs to be done and what needs to be done is that regulator um, need to open up, and uh, and hugely to credits of two regular bodies in Thailand, Bank of Thailand, and certainly SEC here. You know, to have a session like this to open up and listen, right, concerns from both from, from key stakeholders to make this happen. 
And I would strongly encourage regulators uh, globally, don't get scared. You know, it's easy to be scared. Agreed. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I use father and Good son. Good point. <laughs> yeah. I use father and son analogy. You know, father say, you know, I, you know in, my, in my times, you know, this thing never happened, right? I don't want to understand. And kids say, no, in my time, I never pick up a fixed line phone, you know? The, so there need to be open dialogue and create a framework that can work, right? It's not a completely liberal framework that anyone can do anything, right? That would be very, very scary, yeah? And we got to, um, to be pragmatic here. You know, those on the extreme right wing have to tell them that calm down. There need to be step-by-step -step procedure, you know? At the same time, those that are extreme on the left wing conservative need to just tell them that open up, you know, um, understand. And then the work from the objective driven rather than from the emotion or scare or loss of authority uh, point of view. And work with participants that have certain, um, not just involvement, but also um, capability to deliver the real benefit to society, yeah? And that's as an initial step. And once that get going, then, then, you, then, then you get the you know, momentum, right? And, and I think then the whole democratization of financial industry, the peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowdsourcing and all that, crowdfunding and all that, will create huge benefit for society. Yeah, it's, it's a fine line between consumer protection and allowing the industry to grow and evolve. Jason, parting words? Um, just a couple things, I guess. One, this, I agree with you both that it's such a huge opportunity and that we have a lot of responsibility to take in trying to make this happen in an efficient and an effective way. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about is the innovation, the financial technology innovation that this, that crowdfunding will drive, not only in crowdfunding, but across the entire private capital markets. Uh, that's one of the reasons why um, I've been asked to, in addition to my work with crowdfund capital advisors, to join a, a venture capital fund based in uh, Hong Kong that is, uh, will be a, a new fund that will be focused in a number of areas, one of which is uh, crowd finance and in new technologies in, in, in fintech. And these are the kinds of, of innovations that we want uh, to, to find and invest in, and things in, in, in the Asian market uh, specifically. And uh, so that we can maybe find uh, one or two that are successful and grow big enough that uh, pays by and true can purchase one day. Um, so anyway, thank, thank you for the opportunity. And one more thing is just on, on the, uh, the SEC here is that the, the leadership position that they've taken is, is incredible. And uh, you know, whatever we can do to help support that process and, in, in creating the kind of responsible format, uh, we're happy to help. I agree. You know, kudos to the SEC Thailand. Could everybody give a big round of applause to our panel, please? So thank you very much. <laughs>